on to part two of this symphony after chapter eight's crescendo, when a number of people have started tuning out Paul. He moves on to his next movement, which I'm calling intrigue. Right after that crescendo, Paul interrupts with dissonance with a new melody line that seems to violate the work that's been done so far. It's a problem, it's a big problem for his overall argument, the fact that his own people, Israel, have rejected their Messiah. In the next three chapters, nine through 11, he folds that melody into his main theme. This is not an afterthought. This is not an excursus or a tangent. Remember in chapter one, the gospel is the power of God to save the Jew and then the Greek. And in chapter 2, 9 through 10, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first, because of the power of the Torah to concentrate the power of sin, and also to the Greek, to the pagan. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first, because of the blessings of the covenant, and also the Greek, to whom the promises are also intended and who will be grafted in to the people of promise. Paul needs to explain to this church of both Jews and Gentiles what it means that most of Israel has rejected the Messiah who has come to save it. And the way Paul goes about answering this question, I don't think just for the Romans, but for himself, the way he goes about answering this question draws on Moses and the Torah, draws on David and the Psalms, and draws especially on Isaiah, prophet of what it means for Israel to be exiled and then restored, what it means not just to God's own people, but what it means for the nations. Paul draws on these figures to focus Israel's story on Jesus, descended from David according to the flesh, as the fulfillment of Israel's story and as the deep structure of Israel's meaning. Let's look a little at how he does this in Romans 9 through 11. The argument has so many details and so many appeals to scripture that are hard to understand at first that I can't do more than a cursory run through. I hope you take some time and look at how Paul uses Israel's scriptures. But if you're gonna do it, you're gonna have to look at the context of the passages and be patient as you try to understand the direction of his thinking. He raises this nagging problem at the beginning of chapter nine. It's about his brothers and sisters, his kin according to the flesh, biological Israel. He says their rejection of the Messiah leaves him so heartbroken, he wishes he could be accursed and cut off if they were to be brought in. This is not an anti-Jewish exercise in nine through 11. This is an exercise in understanding the way God has chosen to use Israel on the one hand and the nations on the other hand to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham through Israel. In verse six, he claims that Israel's rejection of Jesus doesn't mean that the word of God had failed. On the contrary, it kind of confirms the whole direction of God's word since the beginning of the Torah in Genesis. Verse eight, it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, that would have been Ishmael. It's the children of the promise, Isaac, who are counted as offspring. Likewise, with Isaac's two sons, Jacob and Esau, not mere lineage, not primogenitor, where the firstborn gets the promise, but the promise came through God's divine agency. Verse 11, that God's purpose of election, and we'll in a minute ask what kind of election this is, that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, not just because of sheer birth order and the rules of that culture about it, but because of the God who calls, Rebecca was told the older will serve the younger. I wish I could go into more detail on the next line, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. All I wanna do is point you to Malachi 1, which Paul is quoting here, where Jacob stands for the people of Israel and Esau stands for the nation of Edom, Gentile. And God says that rejecting the nation of Edom demonstrates that his power is great beyond the borders of Israel. In quoting Malachi 1, Paul is demonstrating that God is using Jews and Gentiles together to get his message beyond Israel's borders. In verse 14, he anticipates the next objection. Doesn't that make God unjust? And he says, no. Verse 16, it depends not on human will or exertion. It depends on God who has mercy. 
He has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. And the example Paul appeals to is another instance of God making clear that he's not just Israel's national God. In the face-off between Moses and Pharaoh, God says, I've raised Pharaoh up that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. This is not just narrowly about Israel. This is about my word going out to all nations. Calvinists and Arminians are two camps of Protestants who fight over this section of Romans to try to outline what election means and what it doesn't mean. Well, remember, the problem that Paul is attacking in chapters 9 through 11 is the problem of unbelieving Israel, rejecting Jesus. And where Paul is going with this is it's a demonstration of God's will to save everyone, Jew as well as Gentile. So these aren't just random figures, Jacob and Esau or Moses and Pharaoh, who demonstrate that God cares about some people but not others. These are figureheads. These are personifications of nations, the nation of Israel on the one hand and rivals and Gentiles on the other hand. Here's the point Paul is driving at with these examples. Verse 22, what if God, desiring to show his wrath, God's wrath came up in chapter 1, it'll show up again in chapter 12 and again in chapter 16, it's always operating in the background. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, remember power is a recurring theme in Romans, the gospel is the power of God to salvation to all Jew and Gentile who believe. What if God has endured patiently vessels of wrath prepared for destruction to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, even us whom he's called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, the nations that are folded in to Israel? What if the vessels of mercy transcend that national division? Paul identifies a way to understand what's going on in Isaiah. Verse 27, concerning Israel, Isaiah cries out, though the number of the sons of Israel will be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. That sounds a bit contradictory. Israel will be numberless like the sands of the sea. That reminds you a little bit of God's promise to Abraham that his descendants would be like the stars of the sky. On the other hand, only a remnant of Israel, only a faithful few will be saved. Isaiah supplies an answer to this wrenching, heartbreaking problem Paul is facing. In verse 30, Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, ironically, but it's a righteousness by faith. And Israel, who pursued a law of Torah that would lead to righteousness, didn't succeed in reaching that. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. Paul's fellow Jews, like Paul himself earlier in his life, remember? They misinterpreted the nature of their relationship with God. It was not a merely biological, merely legal relationship. It was a relationship of trust, of faith, circumcision of the heart rather than merely of the outward flesh. In chapter 10, being ignorant of the genuine righteousness of God, the righteousness from faith, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, a righteousness of outward obedience to rules, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Messiah is the end of the Torah for righteousness to everyone who believes. This is an echo of that verse from Habakkuk at the beginning of the book. The righteous one by faith will live. That's a promise for Israel, and Israel needs to hear it. That's where we go next in a passage I wish I could spend time unpacking with you. Verse 5, Moses writes in Deuteronomy, in the very book of the covenant of the Torah, that we're talking about. Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on law, that the one who does the commandments will live by the commandments. But the righteousness based on faith says, and here he quotes another passage near the end of Deuteronomy, don't say in your heart who will ascend or who will descend. Instead, in verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart to obey it. A daring move. This chapter in Deuteronomy is where Moses says, this covenant is not too hard for you to keep. You can do it. And Paul has just been arguing at length that it can't be done. It hasn't been done, and it's produced only condemnation and an intensified slavery to sin and captivity. So Paul unpacks the deeper significance of what it means that the word is near us 
That word, he says, is the word of Messiah, the word of promise that we've seen all the way since Genesis, which does produce salvation. With the heart, one believes and is justified, in verse 10. With the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's a passage from the prophet Joel. What Paul is doing here is a very ambitious reinterpreting of the Torah in light of the fact that salvation has come through the end of the law and the prophets. Their goal, the Messiah, Jesus, son of David. Jumping ahead to chapter 11, Paul anticipates an objection or a conclusion that he wants to cut off. Well, then has God rejected his own people? Is biological Israel written out from the covenant? Have they lost their election? By no means, he says. And wow, this is a statement Christians really should have been listening to for the last 2,000 years. Instead of assuming that Israel, biological Israel, has lost its election because of its rejection of Jesus, Paul is arguing the very opposite. The gifts and the call are irrevocable. The first reason to believe that Jews haven't lost their status as God's chosen people is the remnant that believe in Jesus. Paul offers himself as Exhibit A. Verse 5, at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works, works of the Torah, circumcision, and the like. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? The next round in this dialogue Paul is putting together. Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it by grace, of course, but the rest were hardened. Why were they hardened? Did God just lose his affection for his chosen people? How could that even be? The prophets promise that God is going to bring his people back, even after their infidelities and idolatries. Paul finds that answer in the scriptures. In Isaiah 29, God gave them a spirit of stupor, and you have to know why God has done that by reading Isaiah in context and seeing how the story ends. And by going to Psalm 69, David says, Let their table, his own people's table, become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution. That sounds like God has given up on his people. But Paul knows the whole psalm, and so should his readers, and so should we. Look on the right here in verse 22 of Psalm 69. Let their own table before them become a snare. And when they're at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they can't see, and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your burning anger overtake them. These are all the sinners that David is talking about. Well, you have to go on to the end of Psalm 69, starting with verse 33. For the Lord hears the needy, and doesn't despise his own people who are prisoners. Verse 35, God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. Their offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Now Paul gives the readers his interpretation of these and other passages, which are helping provide the context for understanding what rejection means. Verse 11, did they stumble, did Jews stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. It is after all when persecution breaks out against the church that the church scatters and takes the good news to non-Jews in the book of Acts. It's also after the synagogues resist Paul's message that he tells them, I'm going to the Gentiles, they will listen. Salvation has come to the nations so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, for these other nations, and if their failure, if Israel's failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more, light to heavy, how much more will their full inclusion mean? If God has used a hardened Israel rejecting its Messiah, not a new phenomenon, by the way, right? God's people are always rejecting what God is offering them, all the way back to the wilderness. If God is using a hardened Israel to bring good news to the nations, how much more will God use Israel's faith, its revival, its return to trust in its Messiah, to bring the whole world, Jews and Gentiles, blessing? Verse 15, where Paul is now speaking to Gentiles, If the Jews' rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean? But, and here comes our old theme, life 
from the dead. That's an astonishing return of this theme of death and resurrection. Paul says, when Israel comes to faith in their own Messiah, that will be a resurrection that far exceeds the riches of the present age where the gospel has gone and found a harvest among the nations. He's building to the crescendo in this movement in 9 to 11. 1125, I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers and sisters, Jewish and Gentile. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. He doesn't just mean the people who, in believing, have a circumcision of the heart. He means even Jews who now presently reject the Messiah will be brought in, in answer to the promises that God gave the prophets, that he would have mercy on his people. Isaiah 59, do you see how prominent Isaiah is in giving Paul the guidance for how to understand his present situation? The Deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, from biological Israel, Paul's kin. Verse 30, just as you believers were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. After that crescendo, Paul just can't help but break into praise, leading again with Isaiah. Isaiah 40, where the tone shifts from condemnation to hope. And that's the resolution of this movement, the movement of intrigue, where that at first dissonant interruption is folded into the main theme and turns out to be harmonious. And having resolved that vexing problem, Paul is ready to move on to the next movement, really the final movement, obedience. You saw how prominent the word disobedience was at the end of chapter 11. Well, chapter 12 is going to open up what obedience, the obedience of faith, looks like in Rome among the church there. It's here, finally, after 11 chapters of mainly indicative, right, of mainly explaining how things are the way they are, that Paul brings the main theme of this symphony into full fruition. And that fullness is behavior, the life together of believers obeying the faith. Chapter 12, verse 1, and I've highlighted the most important word, therefore. That means that what's coming in the rest of the letter follows on what has come up until now, the first 11 chapters. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's your rational or spiritual worship. Live out the incredible gift of this new life that God is accomplishing through the power of the gospel. Verse 2, don't be conformed to this age. Don't follow those anti-themes from back in the first couple of chapters. Instead, be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you can discern the will of God. That's what Paul has labored for so long to do in consulting Israel's scriptures, to discern what is the will of God, revealed in the ministry of Jesus Christ and the reaction that it's aroused from both Jews and Gentiles, and understanding it in terms of the old promises. The obedience of faith, a phrase that he's used at the beginning and he'll return to at the end, demonstrates the power of salvation in the lives of those who believe. It's good news embodied. In the first half of chapter 12, it looks like service, service to one another out of the measure of faith God has given each member of his body. In the second half of chapter 12, it looks like harmony and mercy within Christ's body, where we don't take vengeance, we don't do payback, that, after all, is one of those anti-themes that doesn't pay out. Instead, we have mercy, and we leave final justice up to the wrath of God. In the meantime, overcoming evil with good. In chapter 13, a famous section about Caesar and Caesar's sword, the embodied good news looks like respect for outside authorities, all in view of the coming wrath of God. Remember, the wrath of God is revealed, Paul said in 118. And God's wrath still hangs over this whole scene apocalyptically. In chapter 14 and the beginning of 15, the embodied gospel 
looks like the powerful bearing with the powerless. There's that word, power again. And bearing simply with one another. I'm going to take you through this section because it's so important, especially so important today as we face struggles as a multicultural church. 14.1, as for the one weak in faith, and by that, Paul means people who have religious scruples like what not to eat, what holidays, what festivals, what to avoid. Welcome that one, but not to quarrel over opinions. Why? Verse 7. None of us lives to himself or herself. None of us dies to him or herself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. There comes the return of that theme from the results section, that Jesus' death and resurrection have become determinative in shaping our lives, not just our individual lives, but now our lives together, how we treat one another. Verse 9, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. This is pretty interesting because he's turned disputes over whether to fast from, say, idle meat, or non-kosher food, or whether to eat it, into a matter of self-denial, fasting, versus feasting and eating. And fasting is like dying, refusing what one could have, and feasting is like living, indulging in what one can have. And Jesus is the Lord of both. His death and resurrection has made him the Lord of self-denial and the Lord of feasting, the Lord of Lent and the Lord of Easter. And so whether we fast or we feast, we do so out of reverence for Christ. So, verse 13, let's not pass judgment on one another any longer, but instead decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. 15, by what you eat, don't destroy the one for whom Christ died. Verse 19, instead let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Now that main theme of the power of the gospel is being fleshed out, being embodied, in mutual upbuilding, regard for those who are different from ourselves, consideration of others before consideration of ourselves. 15.1, in which these details come to a head, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the powerlessness of the powerless and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his or her neighbor for the neighbor's good, to build the neighbor up, for Christ didn't please himself. If Jesus didn't please himself, then we shouldn't live to please ourselves. This is a theme that Paul will drive home to the Philippians. But here's how he follows this up in Romans. May the God of endurance and encouragement, see, it's hard not to please yourself. It was hard for Jesus not to please himself, but to have the reproaches fall on him. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you, Romans, to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus. All through Romans, Christ is the pattern to whom we are entrusted, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. The embodied gospel is also symbolized in the offering of the Gentiles that Paul talks about in the middle of chapter 15. He's wrapping up this section and he's doing it with the same kind of collection of verses that he amassed at the end of the stage setting section. I will praise you among the Gentiles. Rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, Isaiah has been his template all the way through this letter. The root of Jesse will come, and even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles will hope. This is a crescendo, just like chapter 11 had a crescendo, but neither is the crescendo of Romans 8. And sadly, people miss both of them, who have already moved on to the next song on their playlist, instead of hearing out the whole symphony. The obedience section describes the harvest of the main theme of Christ crucified and risen. And that harvest finally comes at Christ's judgment. Paul alluded to it in 2.16, when the God of peace this is one of the final passages in the letter, will soon crush Satan under your feet, under the feet of this church to whom he's writing. And that brings this symphony to a close. The final movement of obedience brings the main theme to full fruition, 
provisionally in the life of this community, and ultimately through the promise of the restoration of all things at Christ's coming to judge. We're not quite done with the letter. Remember, a Hellenistic letter has greetings at the end and a warning and a benediction. Those come in chapter 16, and they're fascinating. I'm not going to call those greetings a movement. I'm going to call them an after party, the greetings and the celebrations that follow a command performance. In these joyful greetings, anticipating a face-to-face -face visit, Paul is basking in the afterglow of the glory of God that's revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's great. Paul's project has not just been an abstract picture of what God is doing. It plays out in real relationships, which here at the end of the letter shine with the afterglow of the performance and which confirm the substance of that performance. Paul is walking the walk that he's laid out for them. 